Welcome to this presentation about the butterflies in Northern Ireland and about some of the work that butterfly conservation is doing in Northern Ireland. Our work in Northern Ireland is funded by the Northern Ireland Environment Agency. But butterfly conservation is a UK-wide charity. We were founded in 1968 with a mission to conserve butterflies, moths and our environment and we undertake that work in a number of important ways including taking practical conservation action when we need to. We promote the scientific study of butterflies and moths and we make our data available for studies on them. We safeguard the most important sites and we encourage the public enjoyment of butterflies and moths. Butterfly Conservation has over 40,000 members. We have thousands of volunteers who really help us to keep running. And we're very lucky to be supported by a great president who's Sir David Attenborough. Now butterflies and moths belong to a group of insects called Lepidoptera, and this means scaly wings. And if you look at the photograph here, you will see that the wings are made up of many tiny scales on top of the wing. These scales have different colors and they come together to make up the color patterns that you see on a butterfly or moth. There's around 180,000 known species worldwide. And within the UK, we have 59 species of butterfly, which are regular migrants here or resident here all year round. 25 of these are found in Northern Ireland. And in the UK, then we have 2,500 species of moth, 1,000 of which are found in Northern Ireland. And I just want to share with you one of the typical life cycles of a butterfly, which is likely to be seen in springtime. It's the orange tip butterfly. So the males and females get together in spring and they mate and the female will usually lay her eggs on wildflowers, especially cuckoo flower and garlic mustard. And she lays the eggs on the seed pod or the flower stalk. As you can see in the photographs here, these orange eggs are from the orange tip. When the eggs hatch, the caterpillars will feed for about four to six weeks and they'll be feeding mostly upon the developing seed pod. But at a certain stage, they'll crawl off somewhere and they'll usually go to a hard surface like a tree or a shrub. They'll tie themselves to it with a silk girdle and they'll make the chrysalis there. And they'll remain inside this chrysalis for the rest of the year and they won't come out until the following springtime. So this butterfly spends the majority of its life within the safety of its chrysalis. So the adults will emerge from the chrysalis the following year and they'll mate and the life cycle will continue. But not all butterflies behave this way and we have species such as the peacock butterfly and small tortoiseshells. Some of these actually overwinter as adult butterflies and when the springtime temperatures increase you will see them emerge as adults. Sometimes these also come into our homes so if you do find one you can put them somewhere cool but not freezing and dry and with an exit so that they can get out in springtime. Many of these butterflies then will look like a dead leaf so the undersides of them are quite dark this will help them to camouflage and to avoid predation by animals such as birds and bats. But the upper sides can be very colourful and this is the peacock butterfly here. Those will emerge in springtime when the temperatures increase. They will mate and lay their eggs the following spring and their offspring will emerge later in summer. And we also have some species of butterfly which can survive the whole year here. The main example of that would be from the Painted Lady butterfly and they begin the year in sub-Saharan Africa. So in January and February that's where they'll be but they will begin to fly north from their main breeding grounds and they'll fly north into northern Africa. Those adults will land, they will mate and lay their eggs. Then those old adults will die but their offspring will continue the journey north into Europe and they can even make their way into the Arctic Circle so they, they can go over great distances. They're doing this for two main reasons. It's to find more food for their future caterpillars but also to avoid parasitic wasps which can lay their eggs inside their caterpillars. But they can survive the winter here so many of them do make their way to the UK and Ireland every year but they can't survive so they have to go back. So every year, Painted Ladies do a 9,000 mile round trip from tropical Africa to the Arctic Circle, and that's over six generations. So no one butterfly does the entire journey, and it's kind of like a relay race. And it very much depends upon the weather in Europe, about how many Painted Ladies we get. So in 2009, 11 million of them arrived in the UK, and 26 million of them were seen leaving. And in 2019, we had similar influxes here. 
And I want to share with you then one of the examples of a butterfly with an extreme life cycle. Now it's one which isn't found in Northern Ireland. It's called the large blue and it's mostly found in Southern England. But I wanted to share it because it's got an extremely interesting life cycle, which some of our other blue butterflies may also share, but they don't go to these extremes. So the large blue will lay its eggs upon wild thyme or marjoram. And you can see from the top photo that it'll egg there. And then in the bottom photo, you'll see how well camouflaged the caterpillar is against the seed pod, which it feeds upon. But at a certain stage, the caterpillars drop to the ground and they begin to trick red meadow ants into bringing them inside their nests. And this species of butterfly can only do this trick with one species of ant, the red meadow ant. And it does this in a number of ways. It secretes a sugary substance from a thing called the honey gland, so the ants are attracted to it. It also makes pheromones so that it smells like a queen ant grub of that species. And it can rub its plates on its body together to mimic the noises made by queen ant grubs as well. So the ants bring it inside their nest and within the nest it continues to chirp and make noise and beg for food. And it can also eat the ant grubs around it so that it gets more sustenance this way. And the large blue actually requires these ants in order to complete, it, complete its life cycle. Unfortunately though, the large blue became extinct in the UK in 1979. This is for a number of reasons, including overcollecting by butterfly enthusiasts and habitat loss. This was made worse because the red meadow ant requires very short vegetation on sunny south facing hillsides. And that was then made even worse because a disease was introduced called myxomatosis. This effectively eliminated the rabbit population. So in many of the sites where the red meadow ant was found, they began to disappear because the ants didn't have their favorite habitat anymore when the vegetation grew longer, when the rabbits died off. So scientists did work out this really intricate life cycle, but they worked it out too late to take any action to help the large blue. So butterfly conservation, among others, undertake habitat restoration work and reintroduced the large blue butterfly from Sweden in 1984. And they're now doing very well. And we're working with farmers and other landowners to help the large blue spread through the countryside there. But butterflies are in decline and four species of butterfly and over 50 species of moth have become extinct in the UK during the last century. And this was most recently summarised in our State of UK Butterflies 2015 report, which found that three quarters of UK species of butterfly had declined in their range or their abundance over the previous 40 years. And we know this because we have monitoring undertaken by over 2000 sites every year, plus millions of other records, which help us to see what's happening to butterflies. And we also know that some species are expanding and some are possibly responding to climate change. And species such as the orange tip, ringlet and wall brown are all moving north. And then when we look at moths, we can see that they're mostly declining as well. And this was summarised in our State of Britain's Larger Moths 2021 report. It found that the abundance of moths and standardised traps have reduced by 33% in 50 years. And we looked at the long term abundance trends for 427 species. 41% of those had declined and 10% had increased, showing that four times as many species of moth are declining as those which are increasing. We also looked at the distribution trends and we found that a th roughly a third had decreased and just slightly more than a third had increased, again possibly responding to climate change. So why are butterflies and moths declining? Well, in the wider countryside, they're largely declining because of agricultural intensification. And this can include the use of pesticides and herbicides and removal of some of the caterpillar food plants that these species require. Then within woodlands, there's been changes to the management of those. And many of our woodlands now are either with non-native trees that our native species can't use, or the woodlands are very dark, dense places. And the species which require sunny rides and glades are suffering from that. Then within other types of habitat loss, we've lost 40% of broadleaf woodlands, 200,000 miles of hedgerow. We've lost 20 million elm trees because of Dutch elm disease. And now we're also losing our ash trees due to ash dieback, which affects the species which feed upon those plants. We've lost 98% of our flower rich meadows. And now we're also looking at the impacts of things like climate change and light pollution on these species as well. 
And just on light pollution then, some recent research in southern England by Douglas Boys and others found that streetlights reduced the abundance of moth caterpillars and roadside verges by around 33% compared to unlit verges nearby. And there were almost half as many caterpillars and hedgerows near streetlights. So we know that these lights are definitely having some impact on some moth species. The possible reasons given for this could be that adults in lit areas are disturbed by the lights, so they lay fewer eggs. Or it might even be that the lights are disrupting the feeding behaviour of caterpillars that usually feed at night time. And unfortunately, LED lights, which are much more common now, seem to be worse than older lights because they're, they can be brighter and they're releasing light in different wavelengths. One advantage, though, is that they can be dimmed. So we could be working with landowners and governments to reduce the lighting at certain times of night to help these species. And butterfly conservation has a long track record of helping species and changing public behaviour. We work with farmers and local authorities to really make a big impact on a landscape scale outside of our own nature reserves. We restore habitats such as peat bogs, which are very important for butterflies and moths and other animals. We provide advice on large scale projects such as some of the road projects which have been introduced over the past few years, really trying to make sure that these projects can have a bigger impact for butterflies and moths. We also protect the most important sites when we need to, and we will also get involved in species reintroductions whenever we need to as well, such as with the large blue. Now, butterfly conservation can also provide advice for people on a more local level. We can give gardening advice for homes and councils. We can also create new wild spaces in towns and cities. And this is an example of one of our urban meadows we created in Edinburgh. And this meadow now is home to 14 different species of breeding butterfly in this tiny park. We also want to show people the joy of butterflies and moths and get them involved in recording them and looking for them in their local areas. We take part in educational work through our Munching Caterpillars program, and we help volunteers to monitor butterfly species. In Northern Ireland, then, we very often take, undertake work to help our priority species for conservation. We have regular work parties at places like Craigavon Lakes to help the cryptic woodwhite butterfly and near Enniskillen for the dingy skipper. And within Northern Ireland, then we have two staff members. We have uh, our senior conservation officer and our senior engagement officer. And within Northern Ireland, then we're really trying to help our priority species, including the cryptic woodwhite. And the only populations in the British Isles of the species are found in Ireland, so they're very important. And we also have populations of the marsh artillery, which is a European priority species for conservation. And when we look at why we should conserve butterflies and moths, we can do it because they have an intrinsic value and they enhance our lives and they're beautiful insects just of their own right. They've also got a great educational value, especially when we're speaking to young people about ecosystems and food webs. We can speak to them about butterflies and moths and their importance in that way. And they are extremely important for food webs. And we found that whenever blue tits are feeding their uh, chicks, each chick can eat up to 100 food items per day. So if there's 10 chicks in the nest, those adults will have to find 1000 food items, which are usually insects or spiders, to feed to their developing young. So they can eat over 30,000 food items to raise one nest of blue tits. So they're very important for birds and for bats. It's also good for our, our health as well, for our mental and physical well-being, to get outside looking for butterflies and moths. They're also good for pollination of wildflowers and certain orchids, for example, can only be pollinated by certain species of moth. And we know that when we're helping insect pollinators in our local areas, we're also helping ourselves to grow food. And we know that insects are very good pollinators of things like apples, strawberries and peas and beans and things like that. So we'll see all of these lovely flowers turning into fruits that we can eat. And when we grow for wildlife, we are growing a complete food web, helping more wildlife come into our communities. It gives us a greater connection with nature. And for us, it's a simple question of why wouldn't you do this? Because areas which are rich in wildlife are much better for us and they're much more attractive places to be in. Now, gardens cover more than 1 million hectares of land in the UK, but the RHS Greening Great Britain report found that in urban areas, gardens can represent 50% of green space. But unfortunately, we're losing a lot of this green space. 
And in 2005, only 7% of UK front gardens were completely paved. But by 2015, that number was almost 30%. And we know for sure that making our garden for better for pollinators can really help boost their populations. Probably the easiest thing to do would be to avoid what we can refer to as being plastic plants. And we can call them plastic because they don't do much for wildlife. This includes many of the bedding plants, which have been bred and selected to have really showy blooms, which will last for a long time, but have no available pollen or nectar for insects. So this includes some of the bedding plants you can get, like uh, Petunia, Polyanthus, Pelargonium, which is sometimes known as tender geraniums, Begonias, Busy Lizzies, and most pansies. So this is the very short list of plants, which are really very limited use for insects. But the good news is that there are so many more flowers that you can grow in your garden, which are suitable for insects. And we also need to consider the and uh, the shape of plants. So here's photographs of two dahlias, and you can see that the one on the right shows a dahlia covered in bumblebees, and the one on the left is so closed over that no insect has a chance of getting the food which is in the centre there. So it's a really simple thing to do is just to choose these more open and simple varieties. And then the good news really is that if you avoid those few plastic plants and unsuitable flower shapes, almost everything else in the garden center or that you can buy in your garden um, is good for insects. Now here is our list of top plants for butterflies, which grow even in some of the harshest climates. And it's very important that you start planting for butterflies and for other insects very early on in the year. This is because many species will be coming out of hibernation and need as much food as possible to give them a good start to the year. One of the best at this time of year are early flowering heathers and you can get them in pinks or whites. And these are extremely important plants for butterflies when they come out of hibernation, as well as queen bees. Then you could be planting some bulbs such as muscari, sometimes known as grape hyacinth. And even those really big hyacinth bulbs that you get around Christmas time, those will come back year after year if you just put them in the ground. Then there's some herbaceous perennial plants like lungwort and hellebore. But don't forget to use some native wildflowers as well. So you can be growing plants like native primrose and cowslips or bugle or ajuga. And it's very easy to find both of these now in garden centers. Then continuing through the summer, you have plants like Allium, which are beautiful and very easy to grow. And then you have ground cover plants like Hardy Geranium or the Perennial Cornflower, both of which are very good at providing ground cover, meaning that you have to do less weeding in the garden. And you should also consider plants with big heads that the butterflies can land upon and feed upon. There's a type of thistle called Circeum mervillari, and it has fewer prickles than wild thistles, so it's a very good one for the garden. And you can also grow Scabious or Nauteas. Catmint and Verbena benariensis are also two very good choices. But it's really important that we keep planting right until the end of the year. This is because many butterflies will need to feed up with nectar in order to get themselves through the winter. So if we keep consider planting flowers right until September on October time, we'll be ensuring that they'll have a, a better chance of surviving the winter. At this time of year then, plants like sea holly and open flower dahlias really come into their own. You could do some prairie type planting with Echinacea and Helenium. Eupatorium and Phlox are two other good choices. And then there's Michaelmas daisies and Cardoons. Again, both with very large heads, which the butterflies can land upon and feed for a long time. And sedums are a very good choice for places where uh, you might have more thin soil or pots and planters because they can survive a lot of drought. And if you only have a smaller space, you could definitely be growing a herb or a window box to feed yourself and to feed some of the insects which come into your garden. You could have chives and rosemary in this, lavender and thyme, marjoram and strawberry, and things like lemon balm and mint. So these are just a few examples of plants which have leaves which are edible, which can also be used for insects whenever they come into bloom. And it's also very important that we consider the caterpillar stage and we have some of the caterpillar food plants for them in their gardens. Now nettles are some of the most widely used plants for some of our butterflies, including small tortoiseshell, red admiral, peacock and comma. All of these will lay their eggs upon nettles. 
Then also the plants within the cabbage family. These are useful for the white butterflies. And this includes honesty, sweet rocket, nasturtium, cabbage and broccoli. And if you're growing any cabbage or broccoli from seed, for example, you can keep some of them under nets to stop the butterflies getting to them. And then just dot a few others around the garden in the borders, for example, really to help those butterflies which need these plants. You could also be growing wildflowers like cuckoo flower and garlic mustard, which are useful for butterflies like orange tips. Here's an example of a first floor balcony in Sterling, and you can see that there's a hanging basket here hanging from it and an nasturtium growing and just a little egg of a small white butterfly there, showing that even in the most unusual places, you can provide the food and the butterflies will find it. And whenever we're gardening, we should also consider that most butterfly and moth will spend the winter as caterpillars, pupae or eggs. So even when we can't see them, they're very often still there and we need to behave like they're still there. Here's an example of a place where a gardener was clearing away some sweet rocket or dame's violet, taking the stems away and notice the chrysalis of an orange tip on it. Now, if they'd taken these, this material away and put it in the compost heap or burned it or chipped it or anything, this orange tip would have been killed, so it is important to garden with these insects in mind. You can take a more relaxed approach to maintaining the garden by leaving some sections or sides of hedges unpruned and prune them on a rotational basis. Don't chip or burn any cuttings from shrubs and trees because you could be killing caterpillars and you could stack things like this in quiet corners of the garden to allow, allow them to decay naturally, but any chrysalises or caterpillars which are on them will survive then. And you might even want to consider having a meadow in your garden and these can help a wider range of species because you can help have more caterpillar food plants in them. And we definitely prefer whenever people have perennial native wildflower meadows. This is the photograph on the left. Now they might look less bright and flower rich than the cornfield annuals, but those cornfield annuals need re-sowing every year and they tend to not have the caterpillar plants which these butterflies need. So we recommend that people go for perennial natives because these really will be helping our butterflies and moths. If you're not sure how uh, to do this and you want to see what's in your garden already, we recommend first just growing wild. Let the grass grow and see what comes up. You might be surprised what's there already and has just been waiting for years in order to get a chance to bloom in your lawn. You might also then want to begin to add to your lawn with wildflower plugs of some of the more vigorous plants like meadow cranesbill, common knapweed, red campion, and fields, fields gavius, or other plants can, which can scramble above the grasses like bush vetch and meadow vetchling. Now, if you're not a member of Butterfly Conservation already, we'd love to welcome you as a member and we rely on membership subscriptions to help us keep going. This is from as little as £38 a year, around one cup of coffee per month. And new members then will get a gardening book, ID charts, invitations to local events, to get our Butterfly magazine three times a year, as well as membership of our local branch and invitations to members only events. So if you're not a member already, we'd love to welcome you as one. Well. Thank you for listening and just once again to thank the Northern Ireland Environment Agency for funding our work in Northern Ireland.